Gun violence poses serious threats to the safety of all Americans. Yet our country and our state have been slow to find solutions to a problem that plagues our large cities and small towns. Straight ahead, we'll talk about guns, including red flag laws, gun culture in Virginia, guns for self-defense, and how to stop the epidemic of mass shootings. You're watching VPM News Focal Point. Production funding for VPM News Focal Point is provided by the estate of Mrs. Ann Lee Saunders Brown and by Thanks for being with us for VPN News Focal Points. I'm Angie Miles. In this episode, we put the focus on guns. In 2022, Virginia had 20 mass shootings, leaving seven dead at a Walmart in Chesapeake and killing three student athletes at the University of Virginia. Now we explore how Virginians hold varying views when it comes to firearms. Are they tools of death, useful for self-defense, part of recreational culture, how are guns impacting life in Virginia? We begin with a report on Virginia's General Assembly session that ends this week. Joining us from the Capitol is VPM state politics reporter Ben Pavier. Ben, could you give us an update on what happened at the GA this year? Well, Angie, as you know, power is split between Democrats in the Senate and Republicans in the House of Delegates. And that means there's not a lot that's getting done on the controversial topics like gun control, like abortion, most of the bills relating to those topics have already died. Ben, you mentioned gun control laws. How did Virginia lawmakers use bills to respond to recent mass shootings in our state? Well, for Governor Glenn Youngkin and Republicans, this is all part of a broader mental health crisis the state is experiencing. Uh, Youngkin has proposed investing an extra $200 million in mental health services, including things like mobile crisis response teams. And I think there's some bipartisan support for that, but Democrats say it needs to come with tighter gun control laws. They're especially focused on a bill that would have required adults to lock their firearms in a stored lockbox. They argue this would help prevent suicides, which is now the leading cause of death for those under 18. And it would also prevent tragedies like the one we saw in Newport News, where a six-year-old shot their teacher. Ben, are there any bills that you're following that could be able to work around the gridlock and maybe actually pass? Well, Angie, I think one worth mentioning here is a Republican-sponsored bill that would allow colleges and universities to access health and criminal history records of students who pose a significant threat on campus. The sponsors say it was inspired by that uh, tragic shooting at UVA last year, and uh, it's picked up broad, unanimous support in the legislature. Thank you for your insight, Ben. And you can learn more about top bills from this year's session and dig a little more deeply into our stories at vpm.org slash focal point. In 2020, more Americans than ever died of gun related injuries. And in Virginia, the death toll was nearly 1200. As our communities try to address this gun violence epidemic, it can seem that people are at polar extremes when it comes to opinions about guns. But as we spoke with people of Virginia, we found that just like national surveys, opinions are more complex than the extremes. They serve a purpose for hunters and for sport shooters, um, but I don't see the need for assault weapons and high speed mags being used outside of those those uh, applications. I feel if you have good moral standing and good ethical values that uh, owning a gun to be a great equalizer. There's a lot of bad people out there that wouldn't care about laws if they had a gun. So I'm a gun owner myself, so I don't think it makes people bad. I think it's the choices and the, the environments that people are growing up in. I grew up in a pretty conservative household, so safety and all that was really drilled into me for it. It can be very concerning when I feel like People who haven't had the proper training or understanding how to use firearms can get them. I feel like that's when it gets dangerous. Guns being put in the wrong hands. And I don't have a problem with people protecting their families with guns, as long as you use it responsibly. 
Guns in the wrong hands have had deadly consequences. To address this, 19 states, including Virginia, have passed red flag laws, laws that allow police to temporarily remove firearms from people considered an immediate danger to themselves or others. Virginia's legislature passed its red flag law in 2020. VPM's Adrian McGibbon looks at how it's being implemented across the state. And a warning, the story contains a discussion of violence that some may find disturbing. I did not identify as someone who was abused or experiencing domestic violence because I, I felt like I was, you know, accomplished. I owned a business, I actually owned two businesses. You know, I had a big network of friends, so I didn't fit what I thought was the profile of a battered woman. After 21 years of marriage and two children, Lizette Johnson of Chesterfield told her husband she wanted a divorce. She says he'd verbally abused her and threatened her life. In 2009, she'd returned home from church and he said, I love you too much to live without you and then aimed the gun at my head and started shooting. After shooting her, Lisette's husband shot and killed himself. Today, she works with survivors of domestic abuse and is an advocate for stronger gun safety laws. And the substantial risk order would have been exactly what I could have used. The substantial risk order, commonly known as a red flag law, prevents a person who poses a threat to themselves or others from possessing or purchasing a firearm for up to 180 days. The state's chief medical examiner reported a gun is used in nearly two-thirds of intimate partner murders in Virginia. And according to the Giffords Law Center, while guns are used in only 5% of suicide attempts, they are responsible for half of suicide deaths. Lizette wonders if the red flag law could have helped her and her family. Had he not had a gun, things would have been different. And good or bad, my children would have had a father that they could get some closure with. Since the law was enacted, guns were seized across Virginia through risk orders nearly 400 times. Northern Virginia's Fairfax County accounts for nearly one third of those risk orders, the most in the state. We a lot of the times get called to mental health crises where someone is wanting to kill themselves by utilizing a firearm. Um, in those cases, our officers are obtaining an emergency substantial risk order to be able to take that firearm away from that person at the time until they can get the treatment that they might need um, to get their firearms back. Sergeant Amanda Paris is the department's emergency substantial risk order coordinator. Fairfax PD says 61 percent of the risk orders obtained are related to mental health concerns and 25 five percent are domestic violence threats. I will say that I have seen um, people who have, uh, um, the officers have obtained a substantial risk order out on them, um, gone through the court process and be able to successfully receive their firearms back. The law doesn't require the gun owner to seek mental health treatment, but proponents say it presents an opportunity for people to get help. Critics of the law worry it infringes on gun owners' Second Amendment rights. Advocates on the other side are going to say this is about sort of proactively saving lives. I would tell you it's really about guns and guns alone. Attorney Gilbert Ambler has defended Virginians who've faced red flag law orders. He argues the law doesn't reduce danger. With the red flag laws, we leave the person in place, the person who's harassing another person, who's threatening another person, who's potentially threatening themselves, that person is still there. All we do is we remove firearms from them. Also, substantial risk orders are civil charge, so they won't show up on someone's permanent record, but Ambler argues that limits due process. There is no right to a court-appointed attorney. While critical of Virginia's red flag law, Ambler says there is one thing it gets right. This law has a lot of bad parts about it, but one of the helpful things that they did when they wrote this law was they required an independent investigation to occur. Before submitting a request to remove firearms, Virginia's police must substantiate claims of a threat. Ambler says if there's enough evidence, police should press criminal charges. But advocates of the law, like Lizette, insist it's a valuable tool for law enforcement. And here we have this phenomenal law that when somebody is showing signs of distress, we can make sure that they don't have the lethal means to hurt themselves or others.
just this month, Virginia earned federal funding that could provide nearly $5.1 million for police training and further implementation of the state's red flag law. VPM News Focal Point is interested in the points of view of Virginians. To hear more from your Virginia neighbors and to share your own thoughts and story ideas, find us online at vpm.org slash focal point. Support for stricter gun laws tends to increase right after a publicized mass shooting. But polling also shows that even when people want stricter gun laws, they don't necessarily believe those laws will help stop violent crime, including mass shootings. In 2020, Virginia began tightening its gun laws. Almost immediately, gun sales surged. There is a persistent divide in ownership and viewpoints between urban and rural Virginians. Nationwide, the gun ownership rate in our cities hovers around 20 percent, but in the country, it's about 50 percent. Much of that difference has to do with long-standing gun-related traditions among rural families. That's it. Oh, darn. Donovan Cunningham has his sights set on becoming an aerospace engineer. That's a good one. When the 17-year-old is not on the golf course. I attend Smithfield High School. I play golf on the varsity team, and I have been playing golf since I was two years old. I'm also in Beta Club, the National Beta Club at my school, and I have been an AB honor student my entire elementary and high school career. You can also find Donovan singing in his high school choir or at his church, alongside his father. And when Michael Cunningham isn't lifting his voice in praise, he may be serving in the church security ministry. And I look in here to make sure nobody's in here, nobody's done anything they shouldn't have. By almost any measure, Donovan and Mike Cunningham seem like pillars of the community. Michael Cunningham from District 3. Mike serves on the Isle of Wight County School Board. Along with his fraternity brothers, Mike helps provide food for those in need. And he's a veteran of both the Army and the Marines. I had over 31 years in the military, but uh, I started as a uh, E-1, a private in the Marine Corps, and retired from the U.S. Army as a lieutenant colonel. This is one of the things the Cunninghams enjoy the most. Like almost 300,000 Virginians and approximately 15 million Americans, Donovan and Mike are avid hunters. While in the military, even as a, uh, an officer, I ran ranges, uh, rifle ranges and handgun ranges. So uh, I've been around firearms all my life. Oh, I just see a squirrel. You see one? My great-grandfather, that's my mother's mother's father, got me into hunting. My first firearm was a little 22 rifle, single action. Um, my, my grandfather had it in his closet with a sock on it. It was kind of funny, but uh, he said, uh, here, son, uh, but I'm going to teach you the safe way to hunt good, good. And, and respect for wildlife also. I am a certified NRA firearms instructor and recently completed the Stop the Bleed uh, course. I took my son through the uh, hunter safety course, oh, probably five years ago, and he passed that. He did a great job with it. The, uh, the instructor, uh, who was a, um, uh, what we used to call game warden and a conservation police officer, he complimented Donovan for it, for the great job he did. But I won't hunt with anyone that's not ethical and safe, and I won't let my son do it either. And he, he knows how to handle firearms safely. He can see our orange hats, but that's okay. Tradition is the word that comes up most often when Mike Cunningham talks about hunting. Who wants to go find some birds? It's the same for Bill McElwain, who's a retired physician, bird hunter, and trail guide. I am mostly an upland hunter, so that means I'm interested in hunting quail and grouse and woodcock primarily. Uh, I love pointing dogs. I've had many dogs over my hunting career. Uh, currently have three, two English pointers and a setter. And I find that spending time in the woods with them is what's so special about hunting upland birds. All right, let's hunt them up. 
I have wonderful memories of time spent with my father in the woods. He was a very busy medical practitioner, so we didn't get out very often. But I can remember as a boy carrying the little gun, 410 gun, that he had as a young man. And uh, he gave that to me. Uh, and I have had my sons use that. And hopefully down the road, my grandsons may get a chance to do that. Almost every rural household has a rifle and a shotgun at least. And if you drive through these woods out here and in this rural area, uh, you see hunters all the time. It's a part of their lives. And their children grow up learning how to handle a gun safely, how to respect a firearm, and how to use it in the woods. So it's a big part of rural America for sure. You having a good time, old boy? There are lots of positives with hunting and there are lots of positive things that hunters do. They support all kinds of conservation groups, Quail Unlimited, the Rough Grouse Society, Ducks Unlimited, the Wildlife Foundation of Virginia. And these hunters that support this um, give money and time and other resources to help develop habitat. We are so lucky in Virginia, so fortunate to have massive tracts of hunting land, the George Washington National Forest, which we're in right now, being one. And, um, it's very special to have the opportunity to hunt here, but the support of people to improve habitat, it improves more than just the species that they're hunting. It improves it for songbirds, all sorts of other wildlife, and it keeps the forest young and active and regenerative, and that helps bikers, hikers, campers, and fishermen as well. Both McIlwain and Cunningham emphasize that hunting gives more to wildlife and more to conservation than what it takes away, and that constitutionally protected gun ownership need not hinder solving the larger issue of gun violence in America. When you hear about an atrocity like a mass shooting, do you automatically feel a connection with your identity as a firearms enthusiast? It's completely different because there's something wrong with someone that can walk into a church or a theater, a school, and just start shooting. Um, it's, it's, I, and I have no, I, I don't know, I don't have the answers, but I can't, I can't relate to that person because I cannot see going anywhere and hurting, hurting anyone but I believe in Second Amendment rights, so I don't believe the answer is to take all the firearms away from everybody. I know we have to come up with some answer, but we all have to work together. And, and it has to include people who love firearms too. It can't just be the people who have never water. gone hunting. They don't know the positive aspects of hunting. Um, they just, they don't know. They don't understand the gun culture. Good job, dogs. Virginia's Department of Wildlife Resources relies on sales of hunting and fishing licenses to maintain habitats. Annual license sales have dropped by more than 50% over the past 30 years. During the past decade, gun-related deaths in rural America have outpaced those in urban centers, as suicide with firearms has become more common than homicide. Both Mike Cunningham and Bill McElwain say they believe that the kind of family bonding and firearm safety education afforded by gun-related sports could actually help decrease all forms of gun violence. Researchers look for trends, and in the case of mass shootings, the Violence Project studied nearly 200 such incidents that took place over 50 years to help determine what can stop the epidemic. Here's an excerpt of my interview with researcher and author James Densley. Mass shootings have become more frequent and more deadly in our country over the past decade, and Virginia has not been spared the trauma and the loss. In an effort to decrease or end the epidemic of mass shootings in our country, two Minnesota-based researchers have studied 50 years of data and interviewed scores of people, including some who committed mass shootings to find answers and hope for us all. James Densley is one of those researchers. He joins us now to talk about The Violence Project. Welcome to our program and thank you for being here. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. You, you say that labeling someone a monster actually takes us further away from being able to solve this problem when we just can't identify with the shooter in any shape, form or fashion. Could you elaborate on that a little? 
many of these mass shooters feel like the world doesn't see them. And it's that then motivation to perpetrate a crime like this, which is a spectacle. And so we have to be much more attuned to kind of warning signs of this. And to do that, we have to recognize the humanity of each other. And it's hard to do that once they've perpetrated the crime. We want to be proactive and get in front of it. We're looking at guns, and it is a fact that America has more guns than most any other country. It's also true that there is a correlation between the amount of firepower a country has and the number of mass shootings. Now, the debate is it's the guns, it's the mental health, it's the guns. Is it one or the other? I think this is the key point, which is to say that it, it's not just either or, it can be both and it can be all of the above. And so America has six or seven times the share of mass shootings per population compared to other nations. So there is something definitely going on that's uniquely American about this phenomena. And I think access to firearms is a key component of that. But it's important to be able to layer solutions one on top of each other because when we go into our corners and we only want one side or the other, nothing ever happens. So what we find with firearms is there are things that can be done, like safe storage of the firearm, for instance, which can save lives, that don't infringe on anybody's Second Amendment rights. We can put policies in place that make it more difficult for people who shouldn't have access to a firearm to get one. And we can do that in a way that still preserves people's right to bear arms. But we also need to layer that on top of other solutions which address mental health and other aspects of these particular crimes because it's not a one size fits all and it's not one thing or the other. It's being able to do it all and embrace the complexity of the issue. Thank you for joining us on Focal Point. You can watch the full interview on our website. In the Hampton Roads area, gun violence has increased significantly in 2023 compared with previous years. According to Giffords Law Center, on average, someone is killed with a gun every nine hours in Virginia. Local communities are often left to deal with the consequences. For a firearms instructor in eastern Virginia, his contribution to help solve the violence problem comes in the form of education. The images in the story may be uncomfortable for some. You have to defend yourself. Nestled in Virginia Beach is the Strong Arms Gun Club, where Joelle Jones teaches gun safety, education, and training. Right, you're going to be right here. We're simply here to train all of our members in the ways of the Second Amendment and to be more proficient in their farms and to help them defend themselves. And that's in line with the national mission, with the National African American Gun Association. Jones spent 25 years in the U.S. Navy and calls Virginia a gun enthusiast state where gun culture is embedded. We're about that Second Amendment here in Virginia, and, and we're going to keep that going strong. It's not going anywhere, especially in a black community. We're not going to rush anybody through. More specifically, Jones wants women to join his club to learn safe practices for using and being around firearms. So I created a goal that I wanted to have 1,000 women certified in concealed carry. We're going to pull hard and let go. It's been a great success. Right now, I'm at 302 women, and I started this in 2021, right, right after I became an instructor. <laughs> Jones's concealed carry permit class consists of gun safety education boo, boo. and practice shooting time at the local range. Nikki Bynum says seeing other black women in the room learning about firearms is empowering. The stigma is that the man has to be the one to protect, but there's a lot of single women. Are you in immediate fear of death? So you have to be able to defend yourself at all times, I think. So I think it's great that women are in general are arming themselves and getting educated and taking it serious. Tanya Warren, a local realtor, decided to take Jones's class because one of her colleagues was shot and killed while on the job. Are you prepared? The Hampton Roads area has been experiencing a surge of violent crime. Data from the Gun Violence Archive shows that 2022 ended with more than 160 gun violence related homicides across the seven core cities. I've never used a firearm. However, in this climate and with the occupation that I've chosen as a realtor, I've found that it's necessary because we're living in a time where 
people are doing um, active shooting. And as a female, I go into areas all over the Hampton Roads area, and I just want to make sure that I'm not a victim. Warren's husband got her a gun last year, but she was scared to use it. Now she's practicing her skills at the range. I was intimidated and there was some fear. However, I realized I needed to um, attack this head on. So I decided that I'm going to come and get the proper training and knowledge on how to use the um, firearm and make sure that I'm doing it according to the law. Invigorating. So far, Jones has helped 334 women get their concealed carry permits. That concludes our program. As always, we invite you to visit our website to learn more about the stories we've shared and to provide feedback and your own story ideas. That's vpm.org slash focal point. You'll also find links to our full interview about the Violence Project and an extended version of our gun culture story. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Production funding for VPM News Focal Point is provided by the estate of Mrs. Ann Lee Saunders Brown. And by Thank you for watching. Continue to follow Virginia News and Stories by subscribing to our VPM YouTube channel.